Welcome to Live Doc, your online Doc Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem and welcome back to today's Daf, which is Psachim Daf Gimel. We are in the last line of Daf Bezim and Bez, and in the midst of a discussion regarding the precise definition of the word Oyer. We seem to have a machlekes between Rav Huna who says Oyer is in reference to Naghi, which the more presumes to mean daylight. So Oyer means daytime. Whereas Rav Yehuda says Oyer is nighttime, it's Lila. Says the Gemara Mesve, we have a Kasha and a Raya. To the Shita that says Oyer is actually in reference to night. Marzutra, so he was the one who asked the Kasha from the Mishnah. Hamapelas Oyer Lishmonim Vechad, of Isha. She uh, miscarries. On the Oyer, on the night which is prior to the 81st day from her last childbirth. So we know that an Isha who gives birth needs to bring a carbon later. Now what happens is that the first 80 days, let's say she gives birth to an Ikeva, so the first 80 days are called the Yimei Leda. What happens there? So for the first 14 days, any Dom that she would see, she's automatically tummy on account of that. Past that, meaning from the 14th up to the 80th day, so for the next 66 days, any Dom that she would see are called, is called Dom Toyar, which doesn't make her tummy. So in total we have 80 days which are called the Yimei Melois, the, the fill, the, the sequence of the days of the Yimei Leda. Now, we learn, Rashi will bring a, a Gemara, that we learn from a Pasuk, that should she miscarry any time throughout the Yimei Leda, throughout the 80 days from the first childbirth, so if she gives birth again, she miscarries, etc., then she doesn't need to bring a new carbon. One carbon can be applied for both experiences. However, if she gives birth after the conclusion of the main Malois of those 80 days, following the first birth, then indeed she needs to bring a new carbon, one carbon for the first Leda, and another carbon for the second birth. What happens if she gives birth on the night of the 81st day? We have Machlikas. Now Rashi will give us the background to this halacha. Let's take a look at Rashi inside. From the top of the Amid, beginning with the words Hamapelas or Lishmoin Vechad. Says Rashi Bekrisis Perakama. In the first Perak in the Gemara Krisis, the Kaimalon, we learn from the Pasuk Zois Toiras Hayledis. So the word Toiras is inclusive. So this is the Toir of the Yeledis. This comes to teach us that sometimes many birth experiences can be put into the same, under the same umbrella. And one carbon can apply for all of them. This teaches us that she can bring one carbon for many, for many vladets. Now, perhaps from this pasuk we can also learn that she can bring one carbon for the leda, which takes place before the conclusion of those eighty days, and use that same carbon for the next childbirth experience, which happened after the conclusion of those. You may meloyz of those eighty days. Is that so? Yochel shatavi ala leda shulaf nei meloyz v'ala leda shulaf acher meloyz carbon echad v'lo yoyse one carbon for both experiences. Talmud loymer zois. Yeah, tiras is inclusive, but zois tiras is coming to exclude something. It's a limited dispensation, and we don't apply it to a leda which happened after the conclusion of those eighty days. Explains Rashi, If she gave birth after the conclusion of those days, for instance, she went to the mikveh after two weeks of the initial childbirth of the Nikeva, and then she became expectant again, and she miscarried again. So now it depends when that occurred. If that happened within the 80 days, then one carbon can apply for both. But if she gave birth after the conclusion of those you may later, in that case, she was already obligated to bring the carbon for the first experience before the second later occurred. So what happens there? We separate the two. They're no longer no longer stringed together. 
So what happens is Ula Basaif Malay Shalaidashnia after she concludes the Ime Leda of the second childbirth experience, Tabishte Kabanish will bring two Kabanis, one for the first Leda and one for the second Leda. So that's pretty clear. If the second Leda, the second miscarriage happens within the uh, sequence of the Ime Maloyz, within the eighty days following the initial childbirth, then that's included. It, it it's deemed as, as one and the same. Ramam says it's like she gave birth to twins. So you don't separate the two things, and one carbon can be applied to both things. However, if the Leda took place after the conclusion of the Yimei Melois, after the 80, 80 days from the initial Leda had already passed, then certainly it doesn't simply be a, sep- a separate and distinct experience and can't be connected with the initial experience. What happens if, a, if the Leda occurred during the twilight zone? <laughs> Meaning, nor here nor there. The night which precedes the 81st day. It says Rashi Vim Apila Leil Shal Knisa Shmanim Vechod. So that's in between. Why? On the one hand, Shikvar Avra Muloy Shalom. The Mele, the, the 80 days have already passed. It's already past 80. It's, it's already the initiation of the 81st day. So at this point, any dam that you would see would make her tummy. Right? She's no longer considered to be within the Mele Muloy of the first Leda. However, when it comes to Karbanais, perhaps she hadn't yet fully emerged from that Yumeimelois of the initial Leda. Why? Because she's not yet Roy. She doesn't have the ability yet to bring her carbon. She ain't carbon ishka because the carbon can't be initial that night. So it's not yet really the time for the carbon on that first Leda. So perhaps she hadn't really concluded the initial sequence. The initial Yimei Malois. And we should still consider her as though she's within the, the, the first later experience. Because there was not yet a, a, a chiv, a proper chiv carbon. She can, can't bring a carbon yet. So it's as though the Yimei Malois are still there. Are still continuing until tomorrow morning. When the time of carbon comes. And now, certainly, the, um, the uh, Yimei Malois have concluded. And whatever happens afterwards is a new experience. But the night before where it's not yet this amount of carbon, perhaps she hadn't yet fully emerged with regards to the carbon, obviously. We said that any time she sees she's telling me, but when it comes to carbon, she hadn't yet completed the, the sequence of the main melodies because it's not yet the time to bring a carbon. So the question is, do we consider it as part of the main melodies and can be put into the same umbrella as the initial childbirth and one carbon can be applied for both experiences. Although we say, well, she concluded the Yimei Meloi, so it's already past the 80 days and a new carbon is required for the second childbirth experience. Let's see the Gemara again. On the top line, Hamapelos, Eul Shwan of Echad, so she uh, miscarries on the night preceding the 81st day. Bechamachlekes. Bechamei Poitim Recarbon, the exemptor from an additional carbon. They say, well, tomorrow's carbon can be applied to both experiences. Ubesil Machaivim, they say, no, a new carbon is required for the second Leda. Amru Besil Beshamay. So Besil turned to Beshamay. Maishna Ursh Moinavechad, Meyamish Moinavechad. Why would you differentiate between the 81st day and the Ursh Moinavechad, the night preceding? That 81st day. You agree with us that if she would have the Hapalodi later on the 81st day, certainly a new carbon is required. How could you split the day, the, the unit of day, which is night and day together? It's, it's one unit. Generally, we don't split the two things. The same halacha that applies to the daytime applies to the preceding night. So why would you go ahead and differentiate between the 81st day and the night preceding the 81st day? That's number one. And number two, we find that actually there's, there's an equation, there, there, there is a hashva, we equate the two things, the night and the following day. If the night of the 81st is equated to the 81st when it comes to Tumma, she sees Dam, she's Tumma, it's already past the, the Yimei Meloi, she's, she has emerged from the 80 days of the Yimei Leda. If she sees Dam now, it's no longer considered to be Dam Toya, right? 
So if the night of the 81st has the same din as the 81st when it comes to Tumas Dam, apparently she's, she's very, she's very out of the Yimei Leida. Well, you should like the carbon, so why wouldn't it not be equated to the 81st day when it pertains to Allah of carbon? Why would you differentiate between the night of the 81st and the 81st day itself? So Rashi actually brings that on the first argument. Base Shama responded by saying, the Kasha was that, why would you split the night and the day? So Bishamah responds by saying, look, the 81st day is already a time, a sha'a, shiru'uya, lahavi ba carbon. It's a time that's suitable for carbon. So in terms of the chi of carbon, she's already chayiv, and you can't include the next experience within the previous chi. So that's why the 81st day is different than the previous night, because during the night, as Rashi explained, there's no carbon to be brought. So it's not yet the time of Avas carbon. So in terms of the carbonis topic, the carbon context, we consider her to be still within the uh, the childless experience because it's not yet a time of Avas carbon. There's no yet chi, there's no possibility, there's no option of bringing a carbon until daytime arrives. Therefore, anything that happens until daytime is still considered and included within the same experience, within the same context, and one carbon can be applied for both. That was Bishami's response to the first argument. That's why we separate the night from the day. Continues the Gemara. Okay, now pertaining to our sugya, the Mishnah uses the word oir. Oir shmoinim ve'echad. What does oir mean? Says the Gemara. Mi de ka'amar beishilal beishami. From the fact that we see beishil turns to beishami and says, what is the difference between the Ur Shemayinim Ve'echad and the actual Yoim, the day of Shemayinim Ve'echad? Shemayinim apparently Ur, when they say the word Ur, Ur too, it's a reference to night time. That's what they're saying. What is the difference between the Ur, the night preceding the 81st, and the 81st itself? Shemayinim, indeed, this is a raya, a conclusive raya that Ur is referring to night time. Mesve, we have another raya, another kasha. Indeed, that oyer is nighttime. The Brisa says, We know that there are carbonas that are eaten the day of the Hakrabas carbon and the following night, for instance, a So you bring it on Sunday, you eat it Sunday and Sunday night. And we have carbonas which are eaten two days. For instance, So it's going to be eaten Sunday, Sunday night, and Monday. What happens to Monday night? Can you continue eating that shlamim or not? Perhaps the shlamim can be eaten even during the following night. The night preceding the third day. Says the Gemara, perhaps I, um, I can learn it, I can derive this halach that the shlamim should be eaten the following night as well, Monday night as well, by applying the following formula. We have certain carbonates which are eaten for one day, the toida, so it's Sunday and Sunday night, and shlomim are eaten for two days, Sunday, Sunday night, and Monday. So let's compare the two things, just as the toida is eaten during the following night as well, Sunday and Sunday night. So the laila following that first day is included in this manachila, afkan laila achayim, likewise when it comes to the shlomim. The following night should be included in the previous day is halacha. So you can continue eating it throughout Monday night as well. Talmud Leim or no. We learned from a Pasuk that that's not the case. Pasuk says, yeachil So the Shlom is meant to be eaten on the day of the Akrava and tomorrow. And whatever is left over, Ad Yoim. So the Gemara makes a drasha. That you can eat it up until the end of that day. The end of the second day that is. Hu only while it's still day can you eat that carbon. But it can't be eaten past Monday, meaning the following night, the night of the third day. Okay, so you can't eat it. So perhaps now is the time to burn it. No, is meant to be burnt. Yachal yisarf meyat. Perhaps I'll go ahead and burn the, the shlomim immediately. Monday night, as soon as the day is over, 
these vanachil expired, now it's the time to burn it. So you don't need to wait until the next morning. And vidinu, and let's learn it from the following formula, that the zman of burning begins right now. Why? Zvachim necholin liyayim v'layim. We have the karbonos which are eaten for a day and a night, meaning the toy, the Sunday and Sunday night. Liyayim v'layim v'layim. Ushlomim necholin liyayim v'layim v'layim. We have the karbon shlomim, which are eaten two days and a night. So Sunday, Sunday night and Monday. So that's shnei yomim v'layim v'layim. The night in between Sunday and Monday. So perhaps now is the time to burn it. Ma lahalon techya v'lachila sreifa. Just as when it comes to the toy, as soon as you're finished eating it, Meaning, as soon as the Zman Achila expires, Sunday and Sunday night is the Zman Achila, as soon as Monday morning arrives, take of Lachila Shreifa. As soon as the Zman Achila is over, immediately go and burn it. Likewise, Afkan, over here as well, when it comes to the Shlomim, take of Lachila Shreifa. Perhaps, as soon as you finished eating it, as soon as Monday night arrives, you're meant to immediately go burn it. Talmud Loimar, no, we learn from a Pasuk that you meant to wait until tomorrow morning. So whatever is left over from the carbon to the third day, meaning to Tuesday, you meant to burn it. We learn from here, you meant to burn it during daytime. When Tuesday arrives, that is Isman Shreifa, and it's not meant to be burnt at night. And therefore the Shlomim is meant to sit around till the next morning. Then you're going to burn the noise. Okay, now what pertains to our Gemara is, the definition of Ur, apparently, in the context of this Brisa, is as well referring to nighttime. The fact is, the Brisa begins and says, perhaps the Shlomim can be eaten, not only Sunday, Sunday night, and Monday, but also the following night, the night of the third day. Apparently, Ur is in reference to nighttime. Indeed, this is a conclusive Raya that the proper definition of the word Ur is night time. Tashma, we have another raya. Ur shal Yom Kippurim. The, presumably we're speaking about the night of Yom Kippur. Mispal Sheva. So Shemana Esrei contains seven brachas, the standard first three brachas, the standard last three brachas, and one bracha in the middle. Um And it includes the vidui in the Shemana Esrei. Shachris, the following morning as well. Mispal Sheva, Misvada. So the Shemana Esri has seven brachas plus vidui. Be Musaf as well, Mispal Shev Misvada. Be Mincha, Mispal Shev Misvada. And there's a Gersa which says, Be Neila, Mispal Shev Misvada. Be Arvis comes, Arvis late at night. Now, due to the Torah, the exertion and the difficulty as a result of the fasting, as Rashi explains in Yuma, we're more lenient. Mispal Me'en Shemana Esri. He doesn't have to go and embark on this long journey of the full Shemana Esrei, bracha, it's rather Me'en Shemana Esrei is sufficient. So Me'en Shemana Esrei is an abridged version of the Shemana Esrei. We take the first three brachas and the last three brachas and the middle, the middle um, 12 is abridged and condensed into a single bracha and that is sufficient for the Arvis at the conclusion of Yom Kippur. Rebbe Chanina ben Gamliel Oyim Mishma Vaisa so he quoted his fathers as follows. Mispala Shemana Esrei Shleimois you have to really do the entire Shemana Esrei, 18 brachas, why? Because let's remember, it's Matzah Yom Tov, you have to make Havdolah within the Tefillah. So the Havdolah is meant to be recited in the bracha of Chayin Adas, so you need a proper bracha, a full bracha of Chayin Adas to include the Havdolah. Therefore you can't have the abridged, condensed version. Okay, so what pertains to us is, if we take a look at the beginning of the Brai, so Ur Shalem Kippurim, it seems that it's referring to the night time, the night of the beginning begins Yom Kippur with the term of Ur. Alma Ur Urtu. Apparently, the word Ur is in reference to nighttime. Shema Mina. Indeed, this is a right. Tashma, we have another right. The Tani Devei Shmo. We learned in a Brisa that was taught in the Bismarck of Shmo. Lele Arba Osar Boitkinas Achametz. Loyaner. Bdikas Chametz. By the light of a candle takes place when? During the night preceding the 14th day of Nisan. So it's pretty clear that Bdikas Chametz is meant to take place at night. Not the following morning. Alma, Ur Urtu, apparently. Well, now Mishnah as well speaks about the time of Dikas Chametz and describes it as taking place Ur Larba Asar. What does Ur mean? The night. The night preceding the 14th day. So apparently there's no question as to the exact time of Dikas Chametz. It's only taking place at night. 
Ur Larba Asar, mentioned in Al Mishnah as well, is referring to nighttime. Ella says the more rather there's no machlekes as to the meaning of Ur, which is certainly nighttime, as we had just proved from four different places. Ella Bain Rav Huna, Bain Rav Yehuda, the Kuli Alma, Ur Urtu. Both Rav Huna and Rav Yehuda both agreed that Ur is certainly referring to nighttime. So what then is the machlekes? Veloi pligi, and there's no machlekes. In essence, it's just a question of semantics. How do we refer to night? Marki Asri, one Amoira, was using the term which was, which was regularly used in his locale, in his town. Well, Marki Asri and the other one used a term used in his, in his location. Explains the Gemara. Ba'asri de Rafuna. In Rafuna's town, Karu Nagi. They would refer to nighttime with the word Naghi. What does Naghi mean? It actually means light. So the Gilead on the side explains that it's a euphemism, like a blind person is called a Sagi Nur, one who has an abundance of, of light, of vision. So we want to present things in a positive context, in a positive light. So in Rav Huna's town, nighttime was referred to as, as light. Uba Asrid Rav Yehuda Karu Leili. In Rav Yehuda's town, they refer to it directly as Lailei, as night. So, all agree. Oyer Lar Ba'asar, Oyer means night. The Gizchamis takes place at night. The question is, how are we meant to call night time? Nagi or Leili? Okay, so in summary, we had four Rayas that the word Oyer is in reference to night. We had the Mishnah of Amapelis, Oyer Lishmoyne Be'echad. We had the Brisa of the Shlomim, Yochel Yehnechel Oyer Lishlishi, the night preceding the third day. We learned about the Tefillah, which takes place Oyer Shal Yom Kippur, the night of Yom Kippur. And finally, that the Bdikas Chamas takes place, Lele Abasar, which proves that Oyer, mentioned in Al Mishnah as well, is referring to that same point of time, the night preceding the 14th day. And the one concluded, indeed, that's his man of Bdikas Chamas. There's no question that Oyer La Abasar, the word Oyer, is referring to night time. Continues the Gemara. So we have the Tanad Veshmol, who tells us that Digas Chametz takes place Lele Abba Asa. So he calls nighttime with the word Lele. So it's an outright term, a clear term. What about our Tana? The Tana did done. My time will Tani Lele. Why doesn't our Mishnah use the word Lele, which is more clear and, and precise? There's no room for ambiguity. Because perhaps Urla Ba'asar, as we see, can create confusion. What does Ur mean? Night, day. Why doesn't the Brisa, the Mishnah, simply use a clear term of Lele Ba'asar? Says the Gemara, you know why? Lishna Ma'al Yudanokat. The Mishnah chose to use a term which is, which is more appropriate, more proper. Puts things in a positive light. Instead of speaking about the the night time, the darkness, the absence of night, of, of light. The Mishnah uses the word oyer, which is light, in reference to night time. So it's a euphemism again. And said Lishnah Ma'ali, it's a more appropriate, proper way of speaking. Uch the Rishuban Levi, just as the Rishuban Levi told us, the Omar Rabbi Shuman Levi, Lo'ilam al Yoitsi Adam, Dover Mugunam Epiv, a person should always make sure not to utter something inappropriate. So here, although the word Lila is not really so inappropriate, it's not, it's not, it's not bad the speech, but the, the Mishnah, at least in the beginning of the Masechta, explains the Rambam, in the initiation of the Masechta, there's a passage which says, Pesach Varecha Yor, the, the initiation, the Pesach of the Varecha, should shine forth, should, should light, and, and should be presented in a positive manner. So the, the Mishnah insisted on beginning the Masechta, Rather than using the word Lilo, which denotes darkness and absence, it shows the word Oyr, which is light, and certainly it's referring to nighttime, but painting it in a positive light. So Bishum Alevi tells us one is meant to be careful with his choice of words. How do we know that? We know that from our Torah. Share Okamakosa Shmonia Isis. See that the Torah extended itself, used a roundabout mode of speech, added eight additional letters which were really unnecessary. In order to avoid expressing itself inappropriately. As the Pasuk says, when the animals came to the Teva of Noyach, 
Menabehema Torah, so some of the kosher animals, Umenabehema She'enema Torah, and likewise from the behemoths which were not Torah. Instead of saying Tmeya, which is merely a five letter word, the Pasuk chooses to say Asher Einena Torah, which is a total of 13 letters. So instead of five letters, you have 13, which is an additional eight letters to avoid saying Behemahat Meya. So you see a Torah. Torah goes out of its way, extends its, its, its speech, adds letters in order to teach us this lesson that one is meant to choose appropriate and proper language. We find another puzzle where the Torah added nine letters for this purpose. Shanemar. There'll be a person amongst you who will be in a state of non-toher due to a, uh, an occurrence that happened that night, who must carry. So instead of saying, he'll be ish uh, ish tome, the Torah extends itself. Asher lo yator mikri laylo. And um, it's a total of, of 12, 12 letters instead of just saying, Ish Tomei, which is three letters. Tomei is three letters. Instead it says, Lo Yator Mikri Laila, which is twelve, so it's an additional nine letters. Ravina Amar Esa, it's actually ten extra letters. Vav the Tor, because the word Asher Lo Yator has a Vav, so it's a total of thirteen extra letters. Thirteen letters instead of just three, instead of just Tomei, which is three, so it's actually ten extra letters. Rav Akhbarak of Omar, I have another source for this concept where we find that the Pasuk added an additional 16 letters to accomplish this goal to speak properly. Sheish Esri, where do we find that? Shanemar. Ki Omar, this is the Pasuk where Sholem El asked, where, where is David Hamel? Why, why isn't David coming to the meal? And Yohannesom responded, Ki Omar, because he figured Mikrahu, it's, a, it's an occurrence, Bilti Toru, Kilay Tor, something happened, he had a Tumas Keri, which prevented his arrival to the to the meal. So instead of just saying Ki Oma Mikra Tome, the Pasuk says, Ki Oma Mikra Hu built it tar, Hu Kiloi Tar, many, many additional words and letters. A total of nineteen letters, instead of just saying three, just saying Mikra Tome Hu, Tome, which is three letters. So the Pasuk chose a a roundabout way of describing a state of Tuma rather than just stay, stating it outright. And this again is meant to teach us that one is meant to choose his words carefully and speak appropriately and respectfully. We actually have three examples here. One is in the Chumash Bereshis, by the Tevas Noyach. And then we have the second pasuk, which was actually in, in Chumash Dvarim. So that teaches us that only, not only the first four Svarim of the Torah, which is the main portion of Torah, is the Torah careful about its choice of words, even in Chumash Dvarim, which is Essentially, Moshe's own words to Klal Yisrael. Okay, it was Baruch HaKadosh, but it's, a, it's on a different level. It's Moshe's personal words. Perhaps that's different. No, the Pasuk is telling us, no, even there, Moshe Rabbeinu is very careful to choose appropriate words. And then we have the third Raya where it's an, actually in Nevi'im. There as well, not only in Torah, even in Navi, we find this, uh, this care that's taken to um, choose the right type of words. Tanya Devei Rabbi Shmo. We learned in a brisa from the Bismarish of Rabbi Shmo. Teaching us a similar concept. A person should always choose his words carefully, speak appropriately. And we have three rayas to this effect. Shanrei Bezov Kare Mirkov. When it speaks about, Torah speaks about a Zov, who's Tame. And we know that if a Zov sits on a seat, it becomes Tame Tumas Moshe, it becomes an Avatum. Likewise, if he rides on something, Merkav, that also becomes an Avatum. So when the Torah describes these Tumas pertaining to the Zohar, the Zav, the Torah speaks about both, Moishav and Merkav. Shari Bezav Kari Merkav. Ubi Isha Kari Moishav. When it comes to describing a similar Tumah by an Isha, the Torah finds it inappropriate to speak about the position of, of Merkav, which requires a separation of the legs, which is not Sneer, it's inappropriate for the woman to do. So therefore, we don't find that Torah explicitly describes the, the, the Merkav situation by the Isha. It only speaks about Moshe, and we actually learn Merkav from a Drasha. But it's not clearly articulated in the Pasuk. Why is that? Because Torah is trying to avoid an inappropriate description. Because we're meant to choose our words carefully and speak appropriately. We have another 
pasuk to this effect, which says, You meant to choose the mode of language which is employed by Arum and by wise people. My, my lips speak words of, of, of knowledge and borer. Borer means clean and, and uh, free of any impurities. So you see, a person is meant to speak respectfully and appropriately. Now, why did he need three psukim? My v'oimer, why the additional pasuk? The the answer is that from the first pasuk where the Torah avoided describing the Isha's writing, perhaps I would think Hanimil v'deraisa, that only pertains to the actual chumash. The Torah is makved in its lashon because that came from Hashem. So every word there is, is chosen carefully. Abba b'dera when it comes to words that the Chacham speak amongst each other, perhaps loy, there's no need to be so careful. Now we're not speaking about the vulgar language, but the question of choosing this word or that, perhaps it's not so, it's not so vital and, and crucial. Tashma, we learn from the next Pasuk, Vo'imer, Vatif Chalash Narumim. The Pasuk tells you, you meant to choose words properly. The Lashon of Arumim, of wise men. So see, even when it comes to your own personal conversations, you meant to conduct it in that manner. Perhaps you'll think, and you'll say, From the second passage we learn, fine, even conversations are meant to be conducted in this manner, but perhaps it's only when it comes to divrei Torah, where the words carry weight. But when it comes to just plain speech, non-Torah discussions, there's no need to be so careful, to speak so respectfully. That's where the third passage comes in. So just ordinary speech is meant to be clean and pure from impurities. Okay. Says the Gemara, okay, getting back to the Merkav that the third avoids describing the Isha's riding on the animal because it's inappropriate to lack of tzniyas. Will be Isha like Siva Merkav? We don't find that the third references Merkav to an Isha. Vok Siva Tokam Rivka Vanarasel Atur Kavna Al the pastor clearly says that Rivka and her maidservants got up and rode on the camels. How some of be a sus of the gemalim urchiyu? Says the gemara over there since she's positioned up on the camel, so it's a it's a high high position where there's there's fear of of slipping off if you're going to sit sideways without your legs spread apart, clutching both sides of the camel. So over there, urchiyu indeed it is customary and proper even for the isha have a necessity to sit in that manner. Therefore, there's no problem with the Torah describing it. There's no lack of tzniyas here. There's more of a ksiv. We have another passage which says, Moshe took his wife and sons, and he rode them on the, on the donkey. So you see the term rechiva, even in reference to a woman. In that case, since the Pasig is also describing his sons where it's appropriate for them to ride in that manner. That's why the Torah just puts them all together in one category. The wife with the sons because it's not inappropriate since when it comes to sons they may ride, ride in that manner. It says more about Ksiv Yerucheves al We have another Pasig describing Abigail going towards David HaMelech she was sitting on the donkey. Recheves she was riding apparently in a riding position. How is that? Says the Gemara, Hasamisham be a susa de lelia. Urhu, since it was at night, due to the fear of going out and traveling at night, she might collide into something and slip off the donkey if she sits sideways. That's why it's Urhu, it's acceptable to do it in that manner, and it's not considered to be inappropriate. Ibai same another pshat, Misham be a susa de lelia. Leka, it wasn't due to the fear of night. Misham be a susa de davidika, however, there was a fear and trembling on account of approaching David HaMelech. And due to that trepidation, perhaps she would slip off the, the donkey if she's not supported properly and sitting with legs on either side, clutching that donkey. Another pshat. That wasn't a factor, the fear from David. Rather, what type of fear was present? Because she was riding, riding up on the mountain where it's actually dangerous not to sit properly and support yourself securely on the donkey. And that's why it's considered to be appropriate and not a lack of sneers to ride in that manner. Continues the Gemara. So do you mean to say that we don't find ever a reference to the word Tomei in the Torah? 
Well, it's surely not so. The Torah is full of references to the word Tomei. So how's that? Tomei is not really so proper and appropriate. Elo says the more rather the formula is as follows. It depends when. Not in all cases did the Torah go out of its way go to choose the proper language. It depends. When both options are equal and the same, there's no need to add words in order to choose proper words. So the Torah chooses a respectful, appropriate mode of language. However, whenever it would require adding additional letters and words, you would have to extend your, your speech in order to choose respectful, appropriate words. Again, we're not speaking about vulgar language, but choosing more appropriate words than less. In that case, we don't do that because, as we're going to see, speaking clearly, concisely, briefly is also important. So in the case where we would prolong the, the speech, then the Torah indeed chooses the brief mode of language. Just as Ravuna told his name of Rab, some say it was Amr Ravuna Amr Rab, Mishum Rabbi Meir, a Rebbe should always seek to present his lessons to his Talmud in a short, concise, brief format. It's easier to grasp, easier to retain. So, if it involves prolonging, adding, then of course the Torah will do away with that factor. And that's why you find many times, with the factor of choosing proper language, that's why we find many times that Torah uses the word Tomei, because saying Tomei is definitely shorter than saying Loi Tahir. That answers the Kasha. The Kasha was, we don't find Tomei the Torah. Yes, we just certainly do, because it would involve adding words, prolonging the speech, which is also, also has a downside to it. I meant to speak briefly and concisely. So if the if both choices are equal and the same, then certainly we meant to prefer the Derech Kavay, the more respectful form. But not if it entails adding words. Let's see Rashi and so. Up on top, in the middle of that first line on top of the Ahmed, says Rashi Dechi Hadad Inino. So if both modes of speech are equal and the same, none is longer than the other. Shein Oirech Belashin Tzach. The, the clean, uh, more appropriate mode isn't longer, Min Hamaguna, than the less appropriate. Mishto Belashin Kavi. And certainly in that case, we choose the more respectful expression. However, if it involves adding Kalecha, if it involves adding, in that case, we take the shorter route. Ask Rashi Akasha. If that's the case, Vahani Dila'el Ikeim. So why is it that during those, those Psukim mentioned earlier, we find that the Torah did add and go out of its way in order to choose more appropriate wording? How does that fit with this formula? It says Rashi, Lametcha. The Pasuk there is simply trying to teach us a lesson. Trying to present us with the concept to introduce us so the idea should that a person is meant to prefer more appropriate and respectful mode of speech. So the Torah is simply making that statement for us. But generally speaking, we're meant to choose the shorter route. Definitely don't add to your to your words in order to accomplish that goal. In fact, we find that elsewhere the Torah chooses less respectful uh, words. As long as it's shorter, for instance, you have Tommy many times in the Torah. And that too is coming to teach us a lesson. La metcha, shishana adam tami drashim tzara. That person is meant to teach his Talmud in a more brief and concise manner. Why? Because it's easier to retain a lesson which was taught in a concise and brief manner. So the Torah here is teaching us two things, two sides of the coin. On the one hand, one is not to pursue more appropriate mode of speech, but only if it's not the ex- at the expense of being brief and concise. Continues the Gemara. Now we mentioned earlier the Pasuk describing Abigail, the Rechevez al and the Gemara explained, the Gemara justified it because of the fear of the night time, the Ramal. Now apparently now the Gemara did away with all those explanations. Rather, Somehow that Pasuk also concurs and fits in with our formula, the one that we just mentioned. And the Gemara is going to explain. So you mean to say whenever both modes are equal and the same, equally long, 
Mishtoi Velashon Kavod, meant to choose the more respectful mode. What about the Pasuk that we just mentioned, V'yerecheves al Hamar? Recheves is inappropriate. And it seems that we didn't really gain much by using the word Recheves. V'yerecheves v'yoyesheves v'chiyadad ininu. The word Recheves is a five-letter word. And it's not any shorter than saying Yeshevis, which is also, also five letters. And the Pasuk chooses Recheves, which seems to be less appropriate, describing the Isha as writing. So, according to this formula that we just mentioned, that if they're both equal and the same, as far as length is concerned, then certainly we're meant to prefer Derech Kavit. So why did the Torah choose Recheves? It says more Recheves Ksiv. If you look closely at the Pasuk, it has Recheves without a Vav, so it's only four letters. So indeed it's shorter than saying Yoy Sheves, which would require us to have five letters, and therefore we take the shorter route. Okay, so in summary, the reason why our Tana uses the term Oyer Asar, even though he's referring to nighttime, because he wants to refer to night in a more positive sense, and Oyer is, uh, is light, so it's a euphemism for nighttime. And we proceeded to the concept of Lishna Ma'ali, a person is meant to choose appropriate proper wording, and we have several sources. We began with the Pasuk by the Tevas Neich, the animals came. And instead of the Pasuk saying, Behima Atzmeya, the Pasuk added words, Asher Nena Tahira, to teach us that one is meant to be careful with his mode of speech, choose appropriate and respectful language. We have the Pasuk which says, Asher Lo Yetar, we have the Pasuk which says, Bilti Tairu, and very small taught us a couple of other sources. The Pasuk doesn't refer to the Isha as writing. The Pasuk says, Vatev Chalashon Arumim. This comes to teach us that even when the Rabbanim are having conversations, conversations of Torah, they're meant to speak appropriate language. Svasai Barmi Leilu comes to teach us even when it's a non-Torah discussion, the words are meant to be proper, respectful, and appropriate. On the other hand, the Torah teaches us that one is meant to adopt a Derech Sari, even at the expense of Lishnam Alia. We learn that from Behir Recheves Al Hamar, Recheves is shorter than saying Yeshevets. And likewise, we find many times a reference to the word Tami in the Torah, because it's certainly shorter than saying Loi Tahar. Continues the Gemara with several stories to highlight the importance of proper expression and appropriate mode of speech. We're going to have no less than six stories to illustrate this point. Says the Gemara, Hanud Shrei Talmidei, there were these two Talmidim, Davu Yasri, Kamei Dira, they were sitting in front of Ra. So after the Shia, which was mentally exhausting, they express themselves as follows. Chad Omar once said, Shavi Sinon Hai this shear turned us, made us so exhausted, Kedavar Acher Misankan, like a Dover Acher, which is a Chazir, exhausted Chazir. Chad Omar, the other Talmud, expressed himself more respectfully. Shavi Sinon Hai this shear made us, was so exhausting, Kigdi Misankan, we're now like a weak goat. And what happened? Velo Yishtoi Rav. And Rav refused to converse with that other fellow who expressed himself inappropriately, citing a chazir. The Marik says this went on for 30 days like the like a chayrim, like a nidui. Another incident, Hanu Trey Talmidi, there were these two Talmidim, Davi Yasri, Kamei Hill, sitting in front of Hill, Vechad Minayu, Rabbi Nyechanan ben Zakai. And one of them, who's a Riyach ben Zakai, but Amrila, some say it was Kamei the Rebbe, in front of Rebbe, Vechad Minayu, Rabbi Nyechanan, one of them was Rabbi Yechanan. So what happened? Chadama, one of them said, this was the Rabbi Yechim and Zaka, Rabbi Yechim, he said like this, Why is it when they they pick grapes, we're meant to use kalim, which are tar, to contain those grapes. So Betsir is a reference to picking grapes. And the reason is because of the juice which is found on the grapes, which can cause tumor to the grapes. We know that a fruit which becomes moist now becomes hukshal kaba tumma. so the moisture makes it susceptible to tumma. that's why we must be careful with these wet grapes and only use kale which are tar to avoid making them tummy so why is it when it comes to grapes we're careful but not when it comes to olives vein moiskin but tahara when it comes to moiskin which means picking the grapes we're not careful we can use kale which are not tar so he didn't say tummy he said vein moiskin but tahara we're not careful about tahara what about the moisture found on top of the olives? So that was one Talmud way of expression. The other Talmud said, 
So he posed the question as follows. Why, when it comes to Betzira, we do it with Tahara? Umayskin Betuma. When it comes to picking the olives, we do it Betuma. So he said it outright. He used the word Tamit. And the actual difference is, Rashi explains, because the juice of uh, grapes are considered to be useful and have a din of liquid as opposed to the this juice of the olives, which is not considered to be liquid, doesn't have a din of mashka, it's not really, uh, it doesn't really have a purpose and a use. And therefore, it doesn't have the din to be mashka l'kabotum. So you have two Talmidim and two modes of expression. Omar, so the, the teacher, the Rebbe, responded when he heard both of these Talmidim, and he was impressed with a Talmud who was careful to speak respectfully, who didn't outright say the word Tami, and he said, Muftach Ani I'm sure that this one, Shemoira Harabi Yisrael, he will gain stature, he will occupy a position, a lofty position, and Kalash will be a Moira Ra Paisik. And indeed that's what happened. Below Yehoya, Yomam Atam, very few days passed. At Shahira Harabi Yisrael, until this, uh, this Talmud indeed occupied this great position, very soon after this incident. Continues the Gemara. Hanu Tlasa Kahani. There were these three Kahanim discussing the portion that they received at the Lechma Panam. Chad Amar Lu, one of them told the, uh, the fellows, Higiani Kapul. I got such a small portion of Lechma Panam, size of a bean. Chad Amar, Higiani Kazayis. The other fellow says, I got a piece as large as a Kazayis. Chad Amar, Higiani Kaznavala Ta. The other one said, Look, I got such a small piece which um, has the same size of a, as, a, as a tail of a lizard. So this was an appropriate way of, of expression, especially when it, it's in reference to the karbanais, meant to equate it to a lizard's tail. So the other ones, they, uh, they, uh, they grew suspicious of this fellow. Perhaps he's not really a kain, there's something wrong with his lineage. But Kuachrov, they investigated his background. Umatsubayshem is psul. Indeed, they found some sort of psul. That he was an uh, apostle, he was born from uh, uh, an appropriate marriage, and he's a chalul. Thesis learns that they found some sort of avidazora association with him, and he's uh, disqualified from doing that void. And this was as a result of his inappropriate expression, which indicated there's perhaps something wrong with him or his background. Says the Gemara, why did they see a need to investigate his, his yichus? Vaham tanan, haven't we learned in the Mishnah that when it comes to examining the, the yichus of an isha to make sure that she's uh, not a mamzer, etc. So we check her ancestors up until the point of Mizbeach. It's only to check. Once you read a, reach a point where you know the, the uh, grandfather did the avoid of the Mizbeach, you can be sure he's a meyuchas. As Rashi explains, there was a special bezin which took care to investigate the, 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 uh, the family background of the Kehanim. So once you know that he did service in the Mishamidash, you can be sure that he is a meyuchas. So this Kain who was doing the avoid in the Mishamidash, he certainly was looked after and properly investigated. Why did they see a need to go ahead and reinvestigate matters further? Indeed, don't say that it was actually a Shemetz Psul, that he was actually a, a Pasal Kuhuna. But that certainly wasn't the case. Rather, they found Shachatz, uh, haughtiness in him, which makes him Pasal for the Avoidah. Rashi brings that if a person doesn't relate to the Avoidah with the proper respect, such as this fellow who referred to the Lechem Aponim as a lizard's tail, that is sufficient to disqualify him from Avoid. So of course the Bezin did do a proper background check as far as the Yichas. But in this case, since he expressed himself inappropriately and haughtily in reference to the Avoid, that in itself proved sufficient to disqualify him. Yubay Yisayim, another Pshat? Shani Hasam, this case was different. Generally we don't have reason to assume that a coin was already in the base of Migdash. Is perhaps a puzzle. There's no reason to suspect that. But this case is different. Shani Hosam, the Iu, the Iron of Shay. He, he hurt himself. He, he, um, aroused the suspicion by going ahead and expressing himself in this manner, in some inappropriate manner, which indicated that perhaps there's something wrong with him or his family. And that prompted this reinvestigation into the, his family affairs. Continues more with another story of misspeak. Hahu Arma, there was this guy that have a solik v'achil. He would go up to Yerushalayim and he would eat psachim Yerushalayim. Even though he was a guy, he would masquerade as a yid and take part in the Korban Pesach. And then he uh, boasted. Omar, he said, look, k'siv kol b'neich alo yechaboy. Pesach says that a guy can eat. Kol oral lo yechaboy, oral can eat. V'ana, look at, look at me. 
I ate me shufri, shufri, the best cuts of meat of the Karim Pesach. I beat the system. Amr le Rabbi Yehuda ben Maser. So Rabbi Maser responded to him. Mika sofalach ma'alim? Did they give you a portion of the of the tail of the sheep, which is a fatty, tasty meat? Amr le He says, no, actually not. So he told him, look, kisakas la'asam. When you go up to the base of Migdash again, Emil will go tell them, sofali ma'alim. Give me of the um, from the tail. So that's what he did. Kisalik. When he went up the next time, Omer Lusi told him, "Ma'al Yisafli." You know what? Give me from the uh, the tail of the sheep. Omer Lusi. They told him, "Al Yilugavoya Salk." The tail that belongs on the mizbeach. It's not meant to be eaten by us. So now they smelled something suspicious. Omer Lusi. They turned to him and they asked him, "Man Omer Lachahochi, who instructed you to ask us this uh, strange request?" Omar Lahusi told him, Rabbi David Maseiru, he was the one who told me. He said, look, they're jipping you, they're not giving you the uh, the best portion. That's why I demand the alia. Omar Lusi, now they said amongst themselves, my haida come on, what's going on here in front of us? There's something wrong here. Rabbi David Maseiru is telling him to, to ask for the alia, there must be some sort of hidden agenda. Botku Basre, indeed they investigated his background, Vashkechu Darmohu, and they discovered that indeed he was a goy, and they killed him. Shochlei Rebuda Rameser. So as a result, they sent a message out to Rebuda, and they told him, Shalom Lecha, peace to you, Rebuda Rameser. The Advin and Tzivan, although you were out in the Tzivan, which was out of Yisrael, so far away, but your influence is felt all the way here in Yerushalayim. Um, Mitzadoscha, Prusa, your net, is spread out by Yerushalayim, all the way in Yerushalayim, to ensnare this goy. So Rashi explains that this story is similar to the previous story, that due to misspeak and inappropriate expressions, this prompted an investigation. Just as in the previous case with the Kain, they discovered that he had absolved. Here as well, they discovered that he was a guy. Continues the Gemara of Kahana Chalash, of Kahana Felil. Shadru Rabbonon, the Rabbonon sent the Rabbi Shuban Braid Raviti to go see, go check out his condition and report back. Omrle, they told him, Zil B'doyik Madine, go see, go check out his condition. Also, so he arrived, Ashikhe, he, he discovered, he saw the Nach Nafshe, that he already passed away. Kare the Levushe, so he tore his garment. But he didn't want them to see, he didn't want his friends to be frightened. So what did he do? Vahadre le Kare lachari. So he turned the torn portion of his beggar to, to the back, so it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be seen. Ubachi v'asi, he was coming along and he was crying, and they figured out what happened. Amru um, so they told him, Nach nafshe, did he pass away? Amru um, so they told him, look, you figured it out, but I'm not like I'm not going to say it. Umoitzi diba huksil, one who expresses something inappropriate, he's a fool. So speaking about tragedies openly is foolish. I implied, but I didn't want to say it outright. So here's another example of appropriate mode of speech. One final story. Yoichan chakuka, Yoichan for this town, chakuka, Nafak Likriyasa. So he went out to the villages to check out on the, uh, the grains, perhaps he had some farms to see how successful that year's crop was. He also, when he returned to his friends, Omrule, so they asked him, Chitu Nasayafis? Have the, um, the wheat produced properly? Omrulahem, so he told them, Sirm Nasayafis. He didn't want to answer directly that the Chitim crop were failures, he said, Barley was successful. Um, so they told him, barley, that's animal food. Say you basar, go, uh, go, to, go uh, spread the good news. To the, to the horses and the donkeys. Barley and hay, it's meant to be fed to horses and donkeys. So yeah, we understand that you're trying to present things in a positive context. But making reference to a successful animal feed crop doesn't really accomplish that goal. When then should he have said, how then should he have indirectly reported regarding this year's failed wheat crop? So he had one of two choices. Either Ishtakad Nasuchit in the office. He could have said that last year's wheat crop was successful, which would indicate that this year's wasn't. Inami or Adoshim Nasuyofis. This year's lentil crop was successful, which will indicate that the wheat wasn't. Okay, time for a brief Hazar of today's daf. We concluded that when the mission says Urlar Ba'asar, which is the time for Bdigas Chametz, it is certainly referring to nighttime because Ur is Laila, as we proved from four different places. The reason why the Tana used Ur, which denotes light, 
because he wanted to use a positive term in reference to night, as we learn from many sources that a person is meant to choose proper, respectful, and appropriate mode of speech, whether it's in the Torah, whether even the Durabonon, whether even non Torah discussions are meant to be conducted in an appropriate manner, provided it doesn't prolong things, because speaking in a short form, Derek Tzara, is certainly a priority over Lishna Malia. And we concluded with six incidents that highlighted the importance of proper expression. We had the Talmud who said, Dabur Achar Mesankan, this exhausted Chazir, and he was distanced by his Rebbe as a result. The Talmud that said, Ein Moiskim B'Tahara, rather than referencing Tuma directly, he became a Moira Harabi Yisrael. The kind that made reference to the lizard's tail turned out to be a puzzle. The guy who requested from the Alia ended up getting killed. Moitzi Dibahu Ksil, one is not meant to speak about tragedies openly, and the unsuccessful wheat crop, which was referenced to by describing the successful barley crop.